Good day, my name is Michelle Lavander and I'm the director of the USC Center for Health Journalism. Thanks for joining us today for our Health Matters webinar, Telling the Story of Racism in American Healthcare. Racism in medicine is a national emergency. That's how journalist Nicolas St. Fleur characterized the crisis facing American healthcare this spring as his team at STAT embarked on the eight episode season one of Color Code, a podcast exploring racial inequities in American healthcare and the medical mistrust that has followed in its wake in communities of color across the country. In this webinar, we'll take inspiration from Color Code to discuss strategies and examples for telling stories about inequities, disparities, and racism in healthcare systems. How do you sensitively report on these difficult subjects? How can reporters document and substantiate the stories of bias and racism shared by patients? And how can journalists go deeper on broader stories of structural racism and who do we define as experts in these stories? We're joined by Nick, the series host, and Color Code's multimedia producer, Teresa Gaffney, to talk about the journalistic challenges and opportunities for a new kind of conversation about American healthcare and how it can better serve everybody. A word about our speakers. Nicolas St. Fleur is a general assignment reporter and associate editorial director of events at STAT. He hosts the Color Code podcast. He covers the intersection of race, medicine, and the life sciences, and was previously a Knight Wallace reporting fellow for STAT. Teresa Gaffney is a multimedia producer at STAT. She graduated from the Newmark Graduate School of Journalism at CUNY, at CUNY where she studied investigative health reporting. Her work has appeared in The Guardian, The Timmerman Report, and more. Before journalism, Teresa was a book, publisher, a book publicist at Penguin Random House. This webinar is made possible thanks to the generous support of the Commonwealth Fund, the National Institute for Healthcare Management Foundation, the California Endowment, and individual supporters like you. You can tweet about this webinar with the hashtag medical racism. We'll be archiving this conversation later today at centerforhealthjournalism.org. A word about our format today, we'll be hearing from our speakers first, and then we'll turn it over to our audience for questions please feel free to share general comments in the chat. Because we have many people joining us on Zoom, we'll ask you to write your questions for our speakers into the Q&A panel. You can write us there if you're experiencing technical problems as well. Now let's get underway. Nick, color code occupies a unique space. At times, it seems deeply personal. It also has a kind of academic research feel as evidenced by the chapbook of resources included with each segment. Tell us what inspired you to create this podcast. What did you feel was missing in the national conversation and how are you seeking to address it? Hey, thank you so much, Michelle. I appreciate you hosting us and I appreciate you giving us time to talk about Color Code. Um, just some, some quick notes, Color Code, although I am the host, uh, it is very much a team collaborative effort. Uh, mm -hmm. Teresa here is the kind of wizard behind the scenes as I was kind of, as I like to call her. Um, we also have Alyssa uh, Ambrose, uh, Hyacinth Empanado, uh, Crystal Milner helps us with all the photos. Um, we have um, two interns as well, uh, Tino and, and Catherine. And yeah, I just like starting off these conversations by you know, letting everyone know that this is a group effort and all of us kind of came together to kind of put this together. Um, okay, so you asked a bit about kind of how this started. So the origin of Color Code actually begins with our um, photo editor, Crystal. Um, Crystal figured that there needs to be a space or some kind of avenue for us to talk about race and medicine um, other than just in our written stories. And she had pitched the idea of a podcast. Um, this actually predated my coming to STAT. Um, I came to STAT through a Knight Wallace Fellowship, as you mentioned, and that fellowship, I was covering the intersection of race and, and the life sciences and medicine and such. And we received funding um, from the Commonwealth Foundation, which I believe is also funding this kind of talk or funding um, on your um, part. And that allowed us to put together this, this podcast, this idea that we had about, you know, bringing these stories through a different avenue or a different venue that STAT has to offer. Uh, STAT already has two podcasts, but this one was a little bit different in that it was narrative. Um, we took some time to kind of 
particularly research each episode, do some historical digging, speak to um, experts and, and, and produce these, these episodes. Um, so to your question a bit about, you know, what makes color code different or kind of what it is we are trying to do here. Color code allows us to literally, you know, speak with our um, sources literally have their voices heard. Um, oftentimes when we cover stories of racism, you can only do so much when you're writing about it, when you're, um, you know, explaining what happened, but hearing from people, hearing about being, you know, gaslit, having experiences where they felt they weren't listened to from the doctors or, or that doctors were trying to, um, you know, um, 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 stop them from, 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 getting all the kind of information in terms of what happened. We have an episode on maternal mortality that kind of dives into that. We have an episode on mistrust. Hearing that from the sources themselves, the emotions and such, it's just completely different. It's a completely different way of connecting with your, your sources, connecting with the people who are experiencing, you know, racism firsthand in these cases. Um, so I would say that part of what brought Color Code together, part of what makes us different is that it's not just me. It's not just, you know, our team. It is very much so the people who are experiencing this and also the doctors on the front line who are trying to make change. We like to say, you know, doctors trying to give good care, speaking about their own experiences, their challenges, and you are hearing it from them. I think that's what makes it different from some other avenues that we, um, or some other um, ways we cover this subject at STAT, but it is certainly something that STAT has put at the forefront, health equity, um, racism in medicine. A lot of this is also done by our colleague, uh, Usha Lee McFarling. So STAT has definitely been on the forefront of this, or at least puts it front and center. And Color Code is just one avenue where we get to really dive into that and bring my experiences as well as the experiences of our sources, you know, right there for everyone to hear. And, and Nick, one element of color code that makes it so compelling is how you find ways to interject your experience as a Black right. man in America, as a Black journalist. And it seems like you get to pull back the curtain a little and be a whole person, not just the journalist who weighs in from afar. Is, is that freeing? And, and how, how does it help your listeners? Mm -hmm. I like to think of my, I don't know, variety or my flavor of journalism as just being open, <laughs> being super transparent with you know who I am, um, um, bringing myself when appropriate into stories. Uh, one of my you know big stories I did here at Stat was looking at my own colonoscopy. <laughs> so I, if I could be transparent with that, I could be transparent with my own experiences of how I view the medical establishment, how I relate to um, sources, how I experience you know. Um, 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 bias as well, or at least how I, how I view it. So yeah, I mean, the podcast gives us that avenue for me to, to kind of opine, if you will, at times. And Teresa is an excellent coach, um, sometimes telling me, you know, Nick, we need to hear more of you. We need to hear more of your, your experiences, more of how you, this made you feel. And I think that gives us a richer podcast because I am able to bring those experiences. Um, the most uh, kind of probably the most um, obvious example of that or the example of that that you know resonates the most would be an episode we did looking at excited delirium where I kind of compare myself to Elijah McClain um, which we'll hear a little bit later and how his experiences with um, you know the police officers really struck me made me feel like I, if I was in that situation I would have responded the exact same way and then to hear in this particular case you know, terms like excited delirium tossed out, terms like, um, you know, he's so strong in this case, you know, how, how is he overpowering us and realizing like, you know, he's just like me, like, I know my strength. I know when people are kind of, I, I, I just know that from that experience, that's some of what the, the, the police officers are saying just doesn't sound or sit right with me. I know how I would have acted in that case. I know how I would have said similar things. So it's just, bringing my whole self, not hiding my emotions, realizing like, hey, this really, you know, affected me and I'm going to share with you why and why I think it's important for us to delve into this story. And that particular story on excited delirium, um, you know, was something that Teresa really wanted us to dive into to, to kind of begin with. And we approached it from the angle of the historic angle. How did this term come to come to be? And we discovered it's kind of very much racist roots um, that are steeped with racial stereotypes. And 
And yeah, so, and we had our, um, our colleague uh, Issa Cueto, uh, uh, Cueto uh, join us and, you know, report this out from the ground in Miami. Um, yeah, so I would say I try my best to bring my whole self to what I'm reporting because I feel that's something different that I can bring. And why should I hide, you know, my emotions or how these stories impact me? And I, I was going to cool. jump. I was just going to jump in because we can, I have that clip pulled up um, from the Excited Delirium episode and we could, I'll play it in a second. But I think part of it also is that, you know, in a podcast, it's a really intimate medium. You know, it's audio. We're hearing Nick's voice. And I think, you know, we did an episode about the Flexner report, which is this 1910 report that closed five out of the seven existing black medical schools. And at one point we had Nick reading an excerpt from the report in the podcast. And we had to kind of stop and be like, the, the words that we're having him read are like disgusting and like horrific and it's okay. Like it's okay. And it's right to, you know, have Nick kind of in the moment react and hear, like have him speak those words with the kind of disgust that he um, was feeling. But so I do, I want to play the, um, the opening of the episode, which is our fifth episode on excited delirium, um, which is a term that gets used uh, when mostly very often black people are, uh, are killed or die in police custody. Um, and so we started the episode, this is like the very top of the episode with Nick um, talking about his kind of experience of Elijah McLean's death. Um, and this this does not really get into um, any of the details of that death explicitly, um, just in case anyone's worried about hearing that. Elijah McLean was a 23 year old black guy from Colorado. I'm a lot like Elijah. I'm a skinny guy who often gets cold and bundles up when I'm walking home. He had anemia and he didn't eat meat. There was a point in my life where I was vegetarian and I was also anemic. He died after a confrontation with police in 2019. In a situation like that, I too could look sketchy as the 911 caller described him or suspicious as the police officer who stopped him said. And then, when I was watching the video of the police encounter, he explains at first to them that, you know, he was stopping his music, which is why he wasn't responsive at first. Things escalate. They... Yeah. It goes on, obviously. Um, but that's kind of where we wanted to center the beginning of that episode is kind of the, the humanity of the experience and Nick being the host and being the authority of the podcast, but also like an authority of his own experience, I think really grounded that. And I feel like it also shows that, you know, this is a fear that many black men like myself have. And yeah, I'm a reporter, but I'm, I'm also a black guy. I'm a black guy first in many, in every instance. And, you know, having an example like that, that intersects with our reporting, um, you know, it, it allowed me to kind of, you know, be vulnerable to share a bit about what goes through my head when I see these things and how, you know, when these instances happen for, 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 for black guys like me and for black people, they emotionally wreck us. They honestly do. Um, and, you know, there are times where I can't even like focus on work because of the latest police shooting, or I have to talk with some of my black colleagues and be like, Hey, are you good? Like, how are you doing? Um, yeah. I mean, don't even get me started on like the shooting in Buffalo and like just showing that these really bring that what happens outside, you know, it, it affects us as people, affects me as a black guy, but it has intersectionality with my, my work. Um, you know, I don't think I could have done that story without also talking a bit about how I felt. Uh, I, I, it just wouldn't have felt right um, to just, you know, say, oh, this happened to Elijah or this happened to, you know, George Floyd, like, and, you know, just continue on with it. I, 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 I had to, I wanted to. And I was, um, you know, very much encouraged as well to share my emotions, to share what I thought. And I think it kind of makes the podcast, especially that episode, a bit richer too, to kind of hear those perspectives. And, and Nick or Teresa, for those who haven't listened to that episode, maybe before we move on to some other areas, just quickly explain to us how this this I, this excited delirium has been sort of deployed as, in a, I don't know, maybe even weaponized, just like, what is it? And so we understand Elijah's story a little bit too. You want to take that, Teresa? <laughs> yeah, it, let me give it a and try. You're on it, the ground. <laughs> it's so, it, it, yeah, it's a hard thing to kind of 
it it's it's hard to talk about and we we struggled with writing the script um so excited delirium is a term that uh is often described as a condition um that it kind of was birthed in a medical examiner's office in Miami in uh the 80s in the 70s and 80s and basically the the kind of way that it gets described is uh, someone might have superhuman strength or, and, you know, uh, be really manic. They might have a high body temperature. It's something that kind of started out in a, in Miami, they were looking, they had a, a lot of uh, drug cases that they were trying to figure out what was happening. But what it's become is this term that uh, police use uh, to like, you know, in cases where they're uh, detaining a, often a black person. And so in, in Elijah McLean's case, um, I think it was it was excited delirium was one of many theories put forward on uh, the coroner's report. Like, oh, maybe this is why he died. Like, it wasn't, you know, what the police did to him. It was maybe it was excited delirium. Um, and so it's kind of a a term that the wider medical community does not endorse. the The AMA, you know, their medical associations do not typically like like say that this is a, a real thing. There are other types of delirium that are real, but this is not one, um, but it's still being used in these police encounters very frequently. And so we wanted to kind of get into why and where and kind of get back to the root of that. And this isn't like unique, right? The, the idea of creating medical terms or something to, to, to kind of describe something that, you know, to describe phenomena that they don't work with that help you know the person who's doing the the pain either feel better or have something that covers their their their, their butt i mean it has a historical example of something called uh drapetomania which was this quote unquote mental illness used to explain why black slaves would want to run away from their masters <laughs> right so this isn't as i was saying it isn't unique coming up with some kind of term in order to justify something and it's like yeah, so uh, we didn't draw that comparison in the podcast, um, but it's something that I kind of came across while I was doing some more reading about it afterwards. And I think it's worth kind of showing that. And, and as Teresa said, you know, in some cases they say, oh, the person gets like this super strength and such. And those are a lot of racist tropes. <laughs> you know, suddenly this person's so strong. They're like the Hulk. I think that was used with describing like Michael Brown or something like in terms of like this person, I just feel so overpowered. And it's just, I don't know, these, these racist tropes that you hear applied to black men and incidences of like police confrontations and such. It's, I don't know, I'm, I'm personally like sick of them. And I get in that in the podcast. I'm like, it's just like, in some cases it's, it's BS. And the doctors we spoke to are very much, um, you know, speaking about that as well. We have an episode where we just have the two doctors speaking with Issa and I about their experiences and their thoughts on this term and, you know, why they think it's BS as well, so. Well, I mean, you're really just emphasizing what an important and rich area this is for for exploration and for for highlighting these things. And 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 like you said, there, there's a lot of other things like this that where people in the medical establishment or people in policing are using these terms, and maybe there's just not enough um, thought going into it. So um, glad that you're having a part in changing that. I, I wanted to turn to something you just alluded to a, a little bit earlier, which was this idea of giving the mic to your patient uh, voices that you're featuring and, and, and you're presenting them. I mean, a lot of people um, feature, especially in radio, uh, a patient, you hear them, but there's something a little different about the way you're doing it, it, it almost like an expert and, and, and giving them control of their own story and then interspersing their voices with those of academics. And so I'm just wondering if you could tell us a little about your approach and the philosophy behind it. Do you see this as, equalizing the power equation between reporter and source? And are there lessons here for other journalists about who decides what constitutes, you know, the news that's fit to print? Right. So just kind of start to take it a, um, uh, um, a swing of that question. A lot of the stories we deal with deal with instances of people feeling as if their doctor, their provider, or someone or there is racist, their outcome is because of racism or something happened because of bias, their skin color and such. As a journalist, you know, we wanna 
of course, say something like, oh, are you sure, you know, that's racism? Are you sure that's this? Are you sure that's that? But honestly, that's, in many cases, it's almost like gaslighting your sources, um, you know, gaslighting them in terms of saying, are you sure what you experienced was racism? In many cases, especially me as a Black person, you'll experience things and you'll be like, oh yeah, no, for sure. Like that happened. Uh, they're not listening to me. And you'll think to yourself, is it because I'm Black? And oftentimes those little voices in the back of your head, even if you can't prove in that moment, oh, they didn't listen to you because you're Black, it, it affects you. It hits you. It makes you think to yourself, you know, why is this happening to me? So one thing I definitely try not to do when I'm interviewing sources who have had these bad experiences with the medical establishment who feel like, you know, racism is at play is I don't try to gaslight them. I listen to how they're feeling because their emotions are valid. How they're felt in that moment is valid. And oftentimes what we have on the podcast is them telling us how they felt, them telling us what they were going through. Um, and we don't shy away from letting them, you know, voice their opinions, voice their concerns. Um, so that's kind of one thing that I, I, I make sure we kind of do with our reporting. Um, I don't think we've ever ask someone like, was that really racism? I don't, I don't think we've ever asked that to someone um, <laughs> because people know how they feel in those moments. And I mean, our episode on black maternal mortality, you know, has one of our um, sources, uh, Char Charlene speaking about her sister who just passed, um, Denise, about how- Denise. Yeah, Denise, yeah, her, that's- Her, sorry, her niece, her niece, Denise. Oh, sorry, 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 sorry. Um, yeah, her, her niece, Denise, my mistake, um, talking about how, um, you know, Black women in general are just not treated right by the establishment. They're not listened to. They are gaslit. And I think, I think we might have a clip about that as well. Um, yeah. and these are very valid concerns and they bleed into this mistrust. If you feel like you're not being listened to, you don't have to take every moment when you're having an interaction with a doctor or, or a nurse or something and ask them, excuse me, are you being racist right now? Or excuse me, are you being biased right now? Then they're never gonna say, oh yes, I'm being racist or oh yes, I'm being biased. And you don't need to hear that in order to confirm how the people are feeling, how they're feeling ignored. Um, so we give them the opportunity to just voice their emotions, voice how they are feeling. Um, and Teresa, if you wanna kind of play that clip. Yeah, yeah, so just to set this up, this is, um from our yeah, maternal mortality episode. This is Charlene, whose niece um, went to, was, gave birth. And then I think about a month later, and she was experiencing postpartum depression, but a month later, Denise went to the hospital for postpartum and their family found out and they were told, uh, you know, like a day or two later, like she, she's good. She, we're going to discharge her. And they were like, we're not sure. And then they found out a day later that she had died and it was a really obviously traumatic experience for everyone. And they are still really, they're still asking a lot of questions about how she died, what happened, why they weren't informed earlier about something. Um, but so this is, you know, as Nick was kind of saying, patients and, and people are the authority of on their own experience. And so we have tried to treat sources who have had an experience as experts on their own experience um, and kind of having them in conversation with more academic experts, but so this is just a clip of Charlene talking about um, kind of the effect that this experience has had on her and her family and what it means. The whole system has failed my niece and they are continuing to fail women of color. We say something is wrong with us, it's, it's, it's ignored. No one is is listening and we are dying my life my family's life Denise most importantly Denise's children lives have changed I have become an advocate yeah and I mean to hear that to hear her you know being so altered by this experience that it changes the trajectory of her and her work. She's now an advocate. She wants to make sure this doesn't happen to other women or if it does that their family has support. And that's something we discovered while we were reporting this story on black maternal health, that there is this whole family, this whole community of people who are bonded 
through tragedy, the tragedy of losing their loved one, the tragedy of losing their daughter, of their spouse, of, of, of their mother. Yeah. And they have all come together to support each other. Um, you know, I, I've been reporting on Black maternal health for, for, for a little bit now through, through, through being at STAT, um, you know, before we did the podcast. And I spoke with a guy named Charles Johnson who lost his wife, Kira Johnson, a horrible story about her just bleeding out um, in the, 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 the waiting room um, after she delivered birth. And he said after, you know, after she died, you know, he does it for his kids. He, he continues to share her message so that her his children know, you know, what their mother went through, but also who their mother was and why it's so important we address this. And he says, you know, whenever another one of these cases comes up, someone to call him, he's like, I got you. He'll show up to those rallies. He's like, I got you. They'll be out there outside of the hospitals with signs saying, you know, like, listen to black women or black, um, black lives um, matter, but also like black women's lives matter. Like they're all out there holding those signs, making sure the hospitals hear that and they do it for each other. And it's so, it's interesting to watch. Yes, but you can't help but feel their pain and their grief and their agony to know that this is, this is such a big part of them that, that obviously no one wanted. No one wants to be an activist because they lost a loved one. Um, but hearing how it's completely altered their lives is just, it's, 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 it's heartbreaking, but it's also, it gives you the sense of optimism to know that people are trying to make this, this change, trying to work together to, 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 to give those resources or to give the empathy that we need to combat um, the black maternal mortality crisis that, that faces so many women and birthing people. And as you're reporting on racism in healthcare settings, how do you contend with uncertainty and doubt? Data certainly shows a broad pattern of systemic racism and unequal outcomes, but how do you take that to an individual case? And, and what is your internal process behind the scenes um, that maybe your listeners don't even know about? You want me to take that? Um, okay. Well, yeah, certainly, um, you know, we do journalism. <laughs> um, we listen to their stories. I, I do want to jump back to kind of what I said earlier in that, you know, we don't, we do our best not to gaslight sources, we do our best not to invalidate their experiences, and then we do our best to present what they are experiencing. Um, in one episode, we have Nicole, a woman who um, had some bad interactions with the medical system. She went through something where she had this, uh, what she felt was an allergic reaction to um, a medication that she had never had before more or less. And because of her experiences with her doctors and such afterwards, that kind of gave her this mistrust. Now we don't go too deep into what may have actually, like what may have caused that, what the issues were. We didn't, you know, ask the hospital and everything like what caused this? What we wanted to portray was how it made her feel. Okay, because she could have had this incident and then the doctors could have said, hey, we're gonna sit down with you. We're gonna walk you through this. We're gonna help you understand this better. We're going to go through X, Y, Z with you, but they didn't do that. They shifted the blame to her. They said, are you sure you didn't have this before taking this medication? Are you sure you didn't have this? And this is something she lives with her entire life, getting these kind of blisters all over her body. Um, so that's, that's part of what we do in terms of like making sure that how our patients, how the patients we interview are, how they're feeling is being heard. Uh, we also speak to a lot of doctors who also tell us about experiences that they've witnessed, that they've seen in terms of like racism. Our first episode, we have Reed Tuxin who talks about um, how he was working with a uh, sickle cell patient and you know, he's in the hospital with um, another doctor. They're talking, they're going through the sickle cell patients like information or whatever. And then the other doctor, you know, puts the, um, puts the, uh, you know, it's a black patient, puts the curtain over as Reed calls it the kind of, um, you know, the, 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 the quote unquote sound for the curtain and says, I think they're just here for drugs. I mean, we took, of course, Reed's word. You, we took him at his word that that happened. Um, we weren't gonna go to the hospital and like verify, did you get like a report of this? Did this happen in this case? And I think that is something that can be, I don't know if it's, I don't know if the word is, is, is tricky for reporters, but in many cases we do just, we do take people at their word when it comes to how they felt or how they experienced moments of racism. And we let the reader kind of listen to it and, you know, think a bit about what that moment means to them. So I think that's kind of one approach that we, we take in terms of like letting the person 
um, you know, speak their truth. Um, but we also see how else these stories have been covered in other media outlets. And that's something that we post at the bottom of our stories. We always post other outlets that have covered this. So with um, the case of Denise who died, uh, we posted we, we, we mentioned in the story that, you know, we didn't come upon this case. Uh, we got it from someone else's reporting and we linked to their reporting in the story so that people can follow up and read more about the case and the story and hopefully watch as it develops. So I think a lot of our, um, a lot of what we also do is we provide those extra sources that other people have done to show, um, you know, how this story has also been vetted. That's one way we do it, I would say. And you mentioned um, when we spoke earlier that you're looking at reports, you're looking at data. I mean, how does that fit into that, the process? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was going to say, I think that there's obviously like with any reporting, there's a lot that's happening that just can't make it into the episode. And especially with a podcast and for us as a, as a pretty scrappy team, we can only have so many voices in the podcast. But so like for let's like, so uh, our last our, the very last episode of the podcast that came out yesterday is about the story of a man called Virtus Hardeman, who uh, had a horrible experience um, it, getting treatment for, uh, well, now why, why am I forgetting what he was getting? Ringworm, scalpel for. ringworm. For ring, thank you, old. yeah, for, for ringworm. And so basically like that, it happened in, it was like 1950. 1927 in Indiana. 19, um, right, so- Right, but so it, right, like we can't go to the hospital really, right? Because it, it's not there anymore. There's a lot. Most most of the people who were there had passed, and but so what we what we could do is is we like luckily we had uh, Virtus's friend Wilbert who did who was not a reporter, and we were trying to keep that in mind right the whole time. Um, but was a friend of, of Virtus's who spoke to Virtus and his friends and his family. So we. We spoke to him, we watched his documentary, but then we also, Nick had a conversation with a local historian um, mm -hmm. to kind of double check, like, okay, like you've seen this documentary, like, and what you, what you, from what you know of the history, like just kind of talking through and trying to fact check as best we can with, with the sources available. Um, and so like the conversation with the historian didn't make it into the episode, but it's something that we were doing just to make sure, right, that, and because it's tricky with a story like Virtus's that is, so there's so little known about it so little written about it um that it, you know we want to make sure that if there are any red flags we're doing what we can yeah yeah so we had that conversation with the historian um throughout like the fact checking process um and yeah i mean that particular story is it's heartbreaking and it's also the kind of story where you know we wonder why more people don't know about it and that's what we were bringing in our interview wasn't so much us, you know, retracing and re-reporting everything that happened to Virtus. It was more speaking to his friend about the documentary that they put together about Virtus's last moments and what, what brought that, um, you know, what kind of compelled Virtus to finally speak out about this, this, this traumatic, um, 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 you know, wound, secret trauma. I mean, just, psychological scar, physical scar that he had been hiding under a wig for 70 years. Um, and in that we have, you know, Virtus's own words. At one point um, from the documentary, they ask, you know, did you think this had to do with race? And we have Virtus saying like, um, you know, I think it was a race thing because they didn't do this to, you know, uh, they did this to the black kids. You know, why didn't they do this at that time to the white kids? And Hearing those from hearing those from his own mouth, from his own words about how he felt about it, you know, we've had seventy years to re really address this and to think about it. I think that in itself is 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 powerful. So in instances like that, we let our sources speak. I mean, in this case, you know, Wilbert had interviewed him. It was part of the documentary, but it was still coming from Virtus in terms of how he felt, what role racism played, and throughout our reporting, throughout our episodes, in many cases, we give it to our sources, whether they be doctors watching this happen in the hospitals, whether they be patients or whether they be the loved ones of people who have died and they voice how they're feeling. And, and to really understand, you know, our medical establishment, our medical system, the relationship that people of color, particularly black people have with the medical establishment, you have to listen to them. You have to hear what they're saying. And if they feel like the outcome of, of, of something that they've experienced is because of racism, that's impacting 
so many other decisions that's impacting if they even want to see a doctor if they want to work with a particular medical school um, um, or, or our hospital so we let them speak and we let their voices kind of tell you why these larger situations that we're seeing happen and before i turn to another question just because Virtus's story is so buried in history and 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 folks might not have seen the or heard the podcast just aired yesterday um, you touched Teresa a little bit about it, but maybe just explain what this treatment was for ringworm and you know how many kids were subjected to it and just just to quickly encapsulate. Yeah, so everybody. so Bert is Hardiman. Um, he's from this town in um, Indiana called Lyle Station, Indiana. It's a black town that was actually founded by uh, former enslaved individuals um, who actually used it as a point on the Underground Railroad to help direct slaves to freedom. And many people in this town, they all know each other. A lot of them are family members. A lot of them are like the Hardimans or like a big family in this area. And in 1927, um, there was an outbreak of uh, ringworm that the kids in the local school had. Um, Burtis himself actually didn't go to that school. He was too young, but he got it from his brother, uh, Melvin, who, who did go to school. The, the thinking is that, you know, they would wear hats and such, and they'd put them all on like the same kind of coat rack. And then that's probably how it, how it all spread. Um, so one day, you know, the, um, as Wilbert's documentary shows, and we're always sure to, um, you know, reference what we're getting from this, from Wilbert's work, from Wilbert's um, documentary. Um, the superintendent uh, was related to someone at, someone high up at the hospital and came to the students, came to their parents and said, hey, we have a new treatment for ringworm. Um, you know, just sign these permission slips and we'll, we'll get them treated. Um, but the parents did not know it was radiation. There was no indication that, and the parents felt they were misled. They ended up, um, you know, suing the hospital afterwards. Um, so the story tells through Virtus's re uh, memory about Virtus, you know, being on this bus, being brought to the, the basement of the hospital because, you know, black people weren't allowed on the first floor and being in line one by one being brought into this room, being, getting this hat put on him, which I believe was like purple and like black stripes or purple and white stripes as he describes it. And the thinking that Wilbert kind of expresses is that each child was kind of given a different dose. Um, and that comes from the idea that uh, the people, well, I'll get into that in a second, but it's basically they're online. And when it's um, Virtus's turn, you know, as he, says in the documentary, as we say, as we open up the episode, you know, the two women, the two nurses, they, he sees a bright flash, uh, his head starts to burn and the woman says, you know, oh, I think I've given him too much. Um, oh my God, I've given him too much. And that, that was the start of him realizing that he was the victim of this, you know, this medical tragedy, this, this, this medical kind of, in many cases, in, um, incompetence, uh, just horrific that this happened to them. Um, but there were 10 of them, right? And from Wilbert's, like, rec um, from Wilbert's documentary and from their physical heads, you could see the ones who were at the front of the line didn't have it so bad. The ones towards the end of the line had it worse, which kind of gave the indication that they were giving them different dosages. Um, and yeah, he went his whole life hiding this under, his, his, uh, under a wig. Um, an Elvis Presley wig, as, as Wilbert likes to say. And it is, it's, 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 it's horrific to see. I mean, the guy died at the age of 85. So he was about, he had, he had this hit for almost nearly 80 years. Um, and it's this wound, it's this wound that's all consuming of his head. At one point, I hate to get graphic, but at one point in the documentary, he's literally touching his skull right there. I mean, could you imagine just how, how, how visceral that is, but how heartbreaking that is to have been the victim of this as a young kid and not just you, but 10 other people. He had it the worst in this, in this particular case. Um, so the whole story is about how, you know, he finally had the courage to, to tell his best friend uh, or, or one of his closest friends about this and to talk about what happened to him that day, why it may have happened and also how it impacted his life. And it's, it's just one of those things where when you see this image of this man who seems so kind, seems so, 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 you know, so quiet, not trying to bring too much attention to himself. Um, and you see what's below his, his, his wig and his hat. You, you, your heart 
breaks. Everyone who I've talked to about this, I mean, we watched the documentary and 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 at different times we had to we had to, you know, walk out of the room and just take that moment in. I mean, we were talking to Wilbert about it and I was just like, Like what he had to endure for so long. And then we, we, we bring all this together to then ask the question, you know, what is owed? What is owed? Um, and in the episode, we talk about how Virtus, he's forgiving. For him, it's about forgiveness. Wilbert, it's also about forgiveness in terms of that they forgive the people who did this to them. Um, me, I'm thinking, what about the justice? What 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 is owed? And then Linda Villarosa, who, who just had a piece out and a book out um, called uh, Under the Skin, where she, um, into, uh, where she tells the story about the Ralph sisters, two sisters in the 1970s who were um, sterilized at the ages of 12 and 14. Linda also ties in what happened to Virtus to what happened to the Ralph sisters and kind of paints this picture of, you know, this is a wider problem, right? So, so, so through, through, through our story, uh, through our podcast, we talk about, you know, racism in medicine. In this last episode, we bring up another R word, um, 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 reparations in medicine. What is owed? And Linda talks a little bit about, you know, financially, what needs to be done to, to, to rectify what has happened, these dark chapters in, 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 in American medical history. Um, so yeah, that's kind of what that final episode looks at. That's the kind of question we leave our readers with. And that's kind of the direction that the experts that we spoke to, you know, where they where they led us for that that episode. So we we leave it really to the reader to to wonder, and to 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 to, to say to themselves, you know, this 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 toll that racism has had on our medical system. How do we rectify it? What is owed? And Nick, I have another couple of uh, and Teresa kind of process questions for you, and then we'll turn to the questions of your audience here. If you have a question, please put it in the Q&A panel. Um, but as you hear these really terrible stories from patients, what, what is your process and your approach when it comes to getting the provider or health system perspective? And, and how do you untangle what's a misstep? Uh, what is something perhaps more nefarious um, that has led to a racist outcome? I, was, I can start on this. I was going to say, Nick, because I think this is this was a particularly interesting and hard question that we asked ourselves both in the episodes about maternal mortality, where focusing on the story of Denise, who had died at, at a hospital in New York, and then also uh, in the excited delirium episode, focusing on the the medical examiner's office in Miami that kind of started the the more widespread use of the term excited delirium and. I mean, of course, in both cases, we we ask for comment from the institution and, you know, ask them to engage with us on the story. Uh, institutions often don't want to do that. But I think for us, it is, and and with Virtus' story as well, it's, it's important for us, I think, to, to measure the intent more, I mean, the, excuse me, the effect more so than the intent. Like, we, we, we couldn't say with Virtus' story, we can't say what, you know, if, if these nurses were purposefully experimenting on on these kids because of their race but what we can say is that it was it was 10 black kids that this happened to and and they were given a an irresponsible dose and and it and it it changed their lives um and so i think and then with like the excited delirium episode um isa and i isa the reporter and then and i went to went to miami to try to just kind of get on the ground and, and talk to some people there and we ended up talking with um, a man who had not been involved in the excited delirium research, but he had been in the medical examiner's office at the time. He was like the, one of the last people alive who he's like maybe one of the last, like very few remaining people who are alive who were in the medical examiner's office at that time working with the folks that we were kind of talking about. And we like got to, got to go to his house and talk to him. And it was really interesting to ask him because he was there questions about, you know, this guy whose office you were next to, like, kind of not like ask him to speak for that guy, but ask him to talk from a more firsthand standpoint, like, what did you see when you were there? And, and he talked, you know, we kind of were imagining excited delirium coming in, and we were imagining it really as like, kind of as, as kind of like these, these old white men in this medical examiner's office being kind of racist. And, and it's not that it wasn't necessarily that, but what it, what this source told us, which is really interesting is, 
he gave us this insight into, you know, it was like, there was a huge drug crisis in Miami at that time. And they had no idea what was going on. They had no clue. And these medical examiners were trying to wrap their heads around like anything, like any info they could find. And, and I think that was just like a really valuable perspective to get. And so I guess just to kind of summarize, like when we could get those perspectives, it was really important to try to have them, but often it meant, you know, in like in Virtus's case, often it meant trying to put aside intent for a second to just to focus on the purely uh, kind of horrific effects of, of a institution's actions. And to, to echo Teresa's point there, like there is, and that kind of something, a point that I've been trying to make is there is validity in someone saying they felt like an action was due to racism um, because that impacts how they feel and that impacts how they continue to interact with the medical system. We very purposely included in our segment on Virtus Hardeman, the part where he is asked by Wilbert, you know, did you think this was had to do with race and him saying, yes, I did think this had to do with the race. Uh, we very purposely included that to show that, you know, to him, that was the perception, that was the impact. That's, that had everything to do with him and the rest of his life. Um, 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 and what happened to the other, the nine other children as well. And, you know, in the case of Charlene, she very much says people of color um, and, and black women are not listened two that is her perception we didn't go back to every person who she's ever talked to in the medical system or every person any black woman has ever talked to the medical system and say hey did you treat them that way because they're a black woman like first of all you're never going to get an answer of them saying oh yeah no i totally you know thought that they were just here for pain medications because they're a black woman no one's ever going to say that it's the perception of that situation it's how the patients walk away from it that shows this was an instance of racism. This was an instance that they felt they were being discriminated against because of their color. And this is something that has happened today all over the place. And as we throw, show through Color Code, through all of our historical examples, has happened throughout American history. And I mean, that's no surprise to anyone. Um, and, you know, we even show an example. I mean, if you want to point an example in our episode on the Flexner Report, as uh, Teresa alluded to in the beginning, there's a passage in there that I read that is disgusting. It uses words that are gross. And it very much says that, you know, black folk are not supposed to be, you know, these particular well-trained kind of physicians. They're, they're, they're more supposed to do, um, you know, the, 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 the idea of like, like high, hygiene or something like that. Like there is this line in that episode that is just so, so blatantly put forward. Um, yeah, that was 1910s, but so many of those, the, that report has had such an impact on black medical education that it kind of, you know, it, 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 it cascades into many more things that we experienced then that we even experience today. Um, so yeah, that's kind of what my thoughts are on it. Well, we're gonna turn now to the questions from the audience here. We'll start out with one from Candice uh, Montague who says, can you explain the process of how you select topics for each episode do you find the source first and then use their issue as the basis for your story or do you select a topic trending underreported first and then find sources to talk about it? Do you start wanna... that? Yeah, so sure. so Talked when we Yeah, when we were conceiving of, you know, of what we wanted to cover in the podcast, um, you know, something like health and equity, it's such a broad topic and we, you know, it in eight episodes, which was kind of like the max that we were gonna, we knew we were gonna be able to do, it's just not possible to cover anything. And so everything. And so what we wanted to do is kind of pick, we started with topics and then we wanted to just kind of find individual stories and, and individual people within those topics, whether it's a patient or a physician or a researcher who could, who could speak to that. And we found the kind of specific stories around that. Um, and I think, you know, it just in, in starting and in, in trying to cover something that's so broad and so vastly undercovered, it's like, it's hard to choose where to start. And so for the season, we started with topics um, and then found the individual stories. Although I think if we get to move forward in the future, it might be slightly different. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we certainly have ideas for the next season. And if all of you all watch and have ideas, feel free to reach out to us as well as we're kind of putting it together. We're still, we're still hoping, you know, there'll be a, a second season where we're waiting for the, uh, the green light on that. Um, but to echo some of Teresa's points, yeah, I mean, some of these were stories that I had known about for 
for a while and wanted to tackle uh, Virtus Hardeman. We had um, um, kind of a stat, all hands on kind of meeting with the editorial where we were talking about story ideas for like the upcoming, I don't know if it was supposed to be months or, 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 or a year or so. And I remember very vividly telling Teresa and the rest of the crew there about Virtus and his story and how I, as someone who covered um, mistrust, as someone who covered health and equity, was shocked to have not heard his story um, because it's just so visceral. I mean, my goodness, the guy's skull is showing. You're seeing his brain tissue. I, I, I hate to get graphic, but th this is graphic. This is what he had to live with his whole life. Um, and yeah, I mean, uh, so that, that had, we had had some time for that in terms of knowing we wanted to, to, to report on it. Um, with some of our other issues, some of them are a bit newsy in that we have, uh, we had one looking at like anti-racism in medical education where we talk about um, 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 Dr. Michelle Morris and how in her case, there were literal neo-Nazis protesting outside of the hospital that she used to work at um, because of her work at that hospital. Um, and, and that had happened like maybe like a month or a few weeks prior to us actually putting the episode together. So sometimes we have episode ideas and then news happens and we incorporate that into it. Uh, yeah. I mean, in terms of blatant racism, that's pretty blatant right there. <laughs> and we have two similar questions. So I'll read both of them. Rachel Thomas says, thank you for taking the time to speak on these important issues. Given all the opportunities you've had to speak directly with those affected by racist treatment in healthcare, have you received any suggestions from those you speak with in regards to making policy changes or driving impact in the healthcare system. And then Michelle B asks, any call to action ideas or strategies to share with health systems and doctors to improve? You want me to take that, Teresa? You can start, yeah. Yeah, okay, so in terms of, let's see, um, things we've learned from our sources. Um, okay, so we had an episode on diversity in clinical trials. And in that episode, we spoke with a source of ours, uh, Jonathan Jackson, who's um, out of um, Massachusetts General Hospital. And he's an expert on you know, clinical trials. And he's, he's one of the most vocal voices I've ever heard when it comes to making sure they are diverse and that they accurately represent the patient population that is affected by XYZ um, you know, disease or who would be impacted by taking this drug. And he's very blatant. <laughs> um, he says things such as like, you know, People of color, especially black people, want to be in these trials. Um, it's just clinical researchers who aren't reaching out to them. So you need to reach out to these people. Um, I think we actually have some 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 clips from him. Teresa, maybe you want to play one? Oh, sure. Let me. You can start with that. The You're okay, doing so it. Wrong. No. So this is um. Well, we've got. I'll play Perfect. one. I'll play one that's that is a more concrete lesson on clinical trials. This might be a bit niche for the person who asked the question, but I would also say that we tried to look at in general, we tried to include as many solutions and people with solutions views in each episode as we could. Um, but you know, again, kind of with what we were saying earlier about picking a topic, it's it's really hard to find solutions to something that's so ingrained in every single step of uh, medicine. But so this is something Especially that Jonathan- solutions that can actually be done as opposed to wishy-washy ones, which right. health equity is filled with a lot of those. Um, but luckily the people who we speak to do have concrete answers. Yeah. So yes, yeah, so this is one thing that Jonathan said. Um, and again, this is about uh, recruiting more diverse participants uh, broadly in, in clinical trials. If you have white people as a referent group in your data set, you're doing it wrong. You're being racist. Please stop. Uh, and so I know I'm going to get a lot of hate mail for that, but it's true. Um, there are lots and lots of things that you can do. So, so number one, the, the best thing that you can do uh, is have a really well-defined, what I'm going to call a sampling frame. So if you think of your larger catchment area, all the people that could do your research study, define a sampling frame. So instead of the people who maybe could do your research study, try to figure out who actually will do your research study based on your selection criteria, based on the fact that you're gonna keep bankers hours, uh, you know, based on the fact you know, that, that individuals uh, from your health system are the ones who are gonna be most likely to participate uh, and really try to drill down who's going to participate. If you don't have a diversified representative population from that sampling frame, that means that you are going to have to try new things in order to recruit that population that is broadly representative or diverse. Mm -hmm. And to piggyback off of that, um, everything that like 
that Jonathan is saying, you got to take it one step further in that. <clears throat> and what we have in, in, our, in, our, in our episodes there is that these clinical trials are now being used to inform our, um, you know, AI and medical algorithms, right? And we have an example about how if you have garbage coming in, you're going to get garbage coming out. So if you don't, in terms of, you know, algorithms that are making decisions that are themselves biased because the data going in was only data from like white folk or were only data from like, you know, men as opposed to women and such. And we have an episode on uh, AI um, bias in AI that, that, that delves into that. Um, I did want to take a quick moment to talk a little bit about data because I know someone had asked us uh, a bit about how we incorporate data. And I would say the best episode for that is one on black maternal mortality, um, where we also have a, a special, like a bonus episode where we speak to an expert on black maternal mortality who tells us about the numbers, how black women and birthing people are three to four times more likely to die during childbirth or from complications of childbirth than white women. She goes on to pre present her research where she was talking about how it's not a matter of education level or income level. Um, in many cases, a woman who, a black woman who is, um, you know, college educated, um, 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 you know, has a high income, has the same rate of, you know, dying during childbirth as a, a white woman who, who, who is not educated or, or has a worse rate in that case. So even when you disaggregate, um, you know, education level and income, you still have those disparities. And those disparities are hinting at, not hinting at, or, or, or like neon light flashing at, this is because of the color of their skin. This is because of how they're being treated. And I would direct people who are interested in this topic um, to also look at Linda Villarosa's uh, 2018 story, looking at black maternal health that was in the New York Times Magazine, uh, which we reference in our, uh, at the bottom of our story on this for, for extra reading, which does a very deep dive into dispelling all of these other notions like, oh, maybe it's something with their like black women's biology or maybe it's something like this. It's like, no, the confounding factor that leads towards um, us seeing higher rates of death amongst black women is that they are black women. And um, we have a question from Fiona Lowenstein who says, can you share more about the show's fact-checking process this is one area where I've sometimes felt confused about how to avoid gaslighting or re-traumatizing patients and sources, as well as avoiding reinforcing health inequities, like needing people to provide certain types of medical documentation, knowing that documentation isn't equally accessible for everyone. You wanna take that? I don't know, maybe the, um, the what you did in, um in Miami might help in terms of like those kind of documents and talking about that in terms of that kind of fact checking? Um, well, I would say if we want to address, I think in regard to patients and, and that sort of, I, okay, well, so broadly fact checking, we um, we did we did kind of a a basic fact check just through like a lot of the the numbers and stuff that we did in our, that like we have in our episode, we'll, we'd have like one of us or, or our like amazing intern, Tino Delamar said, who is a now he has left us to go be, go be a, a, a doctor, um, which is fine. We're, ha we're very happy for him. But uh, he was an intern with us and he, we would, you know, either he or, or Nick or I would, would fact check kind of the most basic facts of the episode. So going to online sources, going to uh, the research that we're citing and making sure, you know, a basic fact check in that way. But yeah, with, with patients, honestly, we, we struggled similarly. I think we, we asked for, um, medical documents when it made sense, but we, we didn't always get them. And I think it, it is kind of, it's hard to weigh that. And I think something, you know, so like in the case of the, the maternal mortality episode with Denise, the, you know, we, we didn't get medical records that we'd asked for, but we talked to multiple family members. We did talk to the hospital, you know, we got a comment from the hospital. Um, it had, we we did original reporting. We went to protests um, and that sort of thing, but there, were, because we were kind of coming in months later, but there had been original reporting. So it is kind of I think it. I mean I don't feel qualified to be giving advice on this honestly sometimes because this is this is my first time really doing this. Maybe Nick, you can speak to this more. But I think right. for us it was a gut check. Um, and the, know, hospital, to, the hospital had put out a statement, um, mm -hmm. and um, in that case we also looked at other reporting on that issue and other people who had verified some of the documents that we didn't get and we made sure to link towards those 
reporting um, later on in our in our article. Uh, but to that question of like how to not re-traumatize or or gaslight people, honestly, I just I listen. I just I just listen, and I make sure that the questions that I'm asking are asked with compassion and with empathy, and that I don't give off the notion that I am particularly doubting their experiences because in so many of these cases, that's where the problem comes from. And you know, this particular case isn't uh, tied to racism, but it is tied to, I guess you could say like sexism and such when um, we, this is an aside from the podcast, but I was speaking to a patient, a long COVID patient, and we were, you know, kind of speaking to her, pre-interviewing her for an event we had at STAT. And some of the stories and some of the things she went through are, were particularly wild in terms of what she had to endure. Um, but you have to be very careful in terms of listening and not particularly doubting what they went through because that's all they hear from doctors is saying, no, there's no way you could be getting this. There's no way. And this was early on in the in, in um, the COVID pandemic. And then we went on to learn that, yeah, long COVID can have drastic impacts on people. It can really be, this can be uh, um, um, debilitating to people. But at that time, you know, everyone was doubting it. So what I do when I'm speaking with sources is I just, I listen, I listen. Um, I see where else that kind of work has been reported. And then if I get the chance, I'll call them and I'll ask them again for those details. And, you know, I'll, I'll make sure that kind of what they said lines up with what they said before, um, kind of just more generally, but that's how I would say I approach it. But yeah, I would say just take the best amount of care as you can to not re-traumatize your, your, your patients. I mean, your, your sources in these cases. We have uh, two similar questions. So I'm gonna read both of them. One is from Tina, uh, I hope I'm not mangling your name, Say, who says, when I talk to doctors, they often say that we need to do things to get people of color to place more trust in the healthcare system, but it seems like doctors and researchers need to do things to earn that trust. Do you see solutions that would enable people to get the healthcare they need without the racism? And then J.R. Rudolph says, what do you say to BIPOC individuals who are skeptical in regards to going to the hospital on a regular basis, but also this vaccination situation with what happens with Bi BIPOC people in the, the past. So maybe uh, it seems like the response might be somewhere in the same territory. Yeah. Okay, so let's see. To try to tackle it, and I apologize if I don't tackle it completely, but listening to what people feel makes them feel safe. Listening to people who are trusted messengers. And being a trusted messenger, you have to earn that title. You can't just say, I'm a trusted messenger now. I'm just someone. No, you have to be in there. You have to do the work. Uh, you know, we spoke with a doctor um, who was doing clinical trial work uh, in, in, in Virginia um, and how he kind of went to, this was reporting done by um, Angus Chen, this was uh, Rob Wynn and, uh, the, in, in Richmond, and basically how he goes to the communities, make sure that they know who he is way before he's ever asking them for something. Um, Reed Tuxin touched upon this, about how you know the people who he's asking when he's doing outreach about vaccines and such, they already know who he is. They trust him. He's a trusted messenger. We spoke with Nicole about how she wants to be a trusted messenger when it comes to um, women, especially Black women who are looking for uh, mental health care. Um, we spoke with um, 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 Arnithia Sutton, who um, in that same first episode, who was talking a bit about how the community knows her. She's been around um, University of Richmond for so long that people understand her. And so when she's speaking about, you know, I think in her particular case, it had to do with like breast cancer. Like people know her, they already know who she is. So understanding that people in these communities, especially black folk have strong relationships with people who already have earned their trust. Um, also understanding that not necessarily every avenue that we put forth as, you know, um, uh, uh, as a medical establishment is the avenue that works best. Example for that, midwives, doulas, some people, you know, they'll like ha-ha at that kind of stuff. But in many cases, Black women and, and birthing people feel more comfortable, you know, having a doula, having someone there um, who has been with them throughout the whole experience when it comes to, to, to giving birth. So understanding that, recognizing that, and respecting that is what I would say is um, 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 a way to kind of address that question of how to kind of build 
that trust or how to at least um, 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 approach these situations in such a way that you make sure that everyone feels listened to and, and heard. So understanding the importance of trusted messengers, understanding you don't become a trusted messenger overnight and understanding you know, why it is important to do that work. We'll take a final question here. I know we're a little bit um, past our end time, but Jamie Frazier says, can you talk more about how racism in healthcare and mental health care affect kids in particular and the compounding effects of those diagnoses or lack of care? About, one more time, about mental it's about health? Kids, kids, racism in healthcare and mental health care and children mm -hmm. and, and the, the effects of those diagnoses or lack of care when something happens to, to kids that is a racist experience? Sure, I mean, um, so just make sure, so are you talking about like incidents that happen to a kid while they're, you know, racist incidents and how that impacts their mental health or do you mean how that impacts their relationship with um, the mental, like the medical establishment? Well, I can't tell, this is a right, right. question, not my own. But, um, but I will say, as I read this question, I'm thinking about your last episode of Virtus and how, you know, this, okay. this five-year-old, right? Getting yeah. blasted with radiation. Yeah. yeah, so I mean, an interesting thing is that uh, in the, the episode, first episode we had with Nicole, um, you know, there were aspects she was telling us about like her first incidences or her first experiences with doctors and how, you know, they, 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 they just her, her, her impact. I think in some cases, like doctors were calling her like overweight. They were saying things about her that just stuck with her, that loved her, that, that, that put in her head that, you know, doctors aren't a good time. Like my experiences with doctors aren't fun. And those may sound benign, um, but they stick with someone. They stick with someone. And then when you have repeated bad interaction after repeated bad interaction after repeated bad interaction, it's a pattern and that pattern, you're, 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 you're building these bricks, you're building these foundations and you're building these, 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 I don't know, mausoleums or towers of mistrust. Um, so to speak to that in terms of like mental health, I would just say it's a compounding effect. Um, just a, yeah, that's how I would say it can be a compounding effect. I, I wish I had some better personal examples of, 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 you know, things impacting me on that level. But I mean, in terms of us looking forward, I think mental health in the Black community is especially, you know, POC more, more broadly, but especially in the Black community is something that we want to further look at. Um, I have ideas for that, that I haven't pitched yet to Teresa, but I will <laughs> for season two, because I think it is something that we need to talk about. I've done conversations um, through STAT slash through the Boston Globe about mental health in the Black community, about how um, young Black boys and young Black people are at higher risk of committing suicide and what needs to be done to, to address that and how, you know, having that mistrust of the medical establishment, how that could lead someone away from getting the help that they need. Um, yeah, so I think, I think to answer kind of your question, it's it's a compounding effect that needs to be addressed early. And the best way to kind of address that is to treat every patient with respect, with care as a human being. And just just to add on top of that, just to kind of, I guess also uh, kind of pitch one, like an episode for people to listen to. I think we have a whole, our first episode in the podcast was about the idea of medical mistrust and how people lose trust in these institutions. But I think in our uh, clinic episode on clinical trials as well, uh, our reporter Angus Chen and then Jonathan Jackson, a, a PhD and researcher at Mass General, they both had really interesting things to say about the way that researchers and, and doctors kind of misunderstand the idea of mistrust. Angus talked to a lot of people uh, in this Virginia community um, where the head of research at VCU there is, is trying to kind of, as Nick talked about earlier, he's trying to connect with the community to build trust. But Angus and talking to people who just live in the community, he was like, you know, they don't like mistrust doctors because of X, Y, Z, you know, uh, kind of controversy things that happened at VCU. You know, it's not because the, the first ever heart transplant that happened at VCU was done on like a stolen black heart. It's because of the experiences that they have at the doctor's office every time they go. Um, and so I think that kind of speaks to just what we've been talking about the last couple of questions of mistrust. You know, it's 
the way that the medical institutions need to change to address it kind of needs to first happen in the way that they are thinking about this idea of mistrust. It's not some sort of, uh, you know, elusive, weird historical thing. It's like in the present in these people's experiences every day. And Nick and, and Teresa, um, just in closing, what, what advice do you have for reporters who want to dive deeper into this space? Teresa, do you want to start? I, I don't know. I as, again, this is this is uh, this uh, this is the first time any of us did a, a podcast project like this, um, mm -hmm. and and it's my first time really doing something like this in a deep dive. So, like the, the advice I want to give is like, I mean, I, like I want to ask your advice. So maybe my advice is to keep asking for advice. I, I would love to hear from Nick, who's done a lot of really amazing reporting on this. Uh, thank you, thank you so much, Teresa. And I would, I'd love to add that, like Teresa, as I mentioned at the beginning, is really the wizard behind all of this. Um, she does a lot with the script. Sometimes the words are like words that she has written and that we workshop together. And she has been such a good colleague, but also coach in helping me, as I said, bring out my emotions, bring out how I'm feeling. And honestly, I don't know what happens after I send her all of my recordings. She somehow puts it all together and it comes out as a beautiful episode, you know, with the help of our like sound engineer, of course. Um, so having a great team, making sure that if you're gonna embark on something, everyone here is on the same page. Everyone here has that same mission. Um, that doesn't mean that everyone agrees on everything together, but that everyone respects each other and is willing to, 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 you know, push the envelope or or or, or to, to, to expand on the kind of coverage that your outlet does through this new medium. So definitely having a strong team, having support of editors. Um, Alyssa Ambrose is fantastic and is always there to champion us. Um, having colleagues like Hyacinth, having um, interns like Tino and Catherine who are also super helpful. Having someone like Crystal who is our photo editor bringing everything together, making sure it looks beautiful on the page. So making sure all of this is to say like have a strong team, make sure you know who you're embarking on this journey with and make sure that you all have those aligned goals of ultimately letting people's voices be heard, letting people and, 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 and listening making sure that you're all there together to listen. Sometimes the conversations we listen to are just so hard, so heartbreaking. We have times when we have to take like five minute breaks just because you just, you, you're on the verge of tears hearing about someone talk about their, 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 their sister who died from maternal mortality or their niece who died from maternal mortality or their loved one or hearing about someone who was the victim of, of, of radiation exposure at the age of five and had to spend the rest of his life 70 years hiding this, hiding this secret from everyone and finally getting to the point where they could share it with their, 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 their one friend and, 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 and how visceral that pain was. Um, having people who you can trust that you can be vulnerable with to listen to these stories, but to also share your thoughts on those stories and people who will help elevate you to tell them and not hold you back and, and, and push you to really make sure you're doing the best journalism you can, but journalism that has an impact. And I really think that's what we've been able to do with Color Code. So to sum it all up, have a good team um, um, and have trust on your team in, in much the same way that you have, you know, that same trust with your sources and that you present yourself as someone who they can speak to, that they can share their stories to, that they can be vulnerable. So yeah, trust, vulnerability, good team. That's what I would say. Thank you, Nick and Teresa for all these insights. Um, this has obviously sparked a fabulous conversation and I wanna thank our audience for their great questions and also just the really fascinating conversation on chat. I can tell that this conversation really resonated for a lot of people. And um, so um, we'll be sending you a survey, a quick survey about this webinar and your ideas for others. So please take a moment to fill it out. It helps us with our work. And should you wanna support this webinar series, the Health Matters series, here's how you do so. I want to wish everybody a wonderful and healthy day. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Thank you for listening. Thank you.